Get rid of that approval seeking immediately. Just get rid of it. Okay, so uh, yeah, we we went over and had dinner, and uh, when we were walking out on the way out, he walked right up to the hostess stand again, and there's like three hostesses and some guy who's like a waiter. They're all standing around, and he immediately starts her asking her, and she writes some note that says "I love you" on it or yeah, something. Yeah, to this dude. And then and I go, "Oh, that's really nice." And she goes, "You want one?" I'm like, "Sure." So she's, "What's your name?" I said, "Richard." She writes it down. I'm like, "Put your phone number down." And she's like, scribbles. I'm like, no, no, put your phone number down. And she like looks at a friend. And I'm like, put it down. And she writes it down. I'm like, great. And I walked, and I walked out to you. I'm like, I just got a number. You're like, that's really nice. You're retarded. She's 17. And I'm like, that's good. You said you know, it's, good, it's good to know that, that that's what our relationship has come to these days. It's, you know, I lose 125 pounds. I get over all this stuff. And then what do you do? You beat me right back down. <laughs> keep that self-esteem. Just keep it. Just beat it right back down. Okay, good. All right, this man. Okay, you guys are picking up on what's going on already. Um, you, were, you were listening to Dr. Paul these last couple of days, and unlike Dr. Paul, I'm like the William Hung school. I've had no formal training. <laughs> Anyways, all right. Okay, guys, all right. I put this stuff together through a lot of reading, studying, journaling over the last few years, and um, it's kind of unorthodox. Some of the stuff you may, well, you'll like all of it. What are you capable of creating for yourself? I got this from a book called Phantoms in the Brain by a neuroscientist. Those who are suspicious of the claims of mind-body medicine should consider multiple personality disorders. Some clinicians say that patients can actually change their eye structure when assuming different personas. A nearsighted person becomes farsighted, a blue-eyed person becomes brown-eyed, or that the patient's blood chemistry changes with the personality. High blood glu- 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 English. High blood glucose levels with one normal glucose with another. There are those also case descriptions of people's hair turning white literally overnight after se- severe psychological shock and of pious nuns developing stigmata on their palms in ecstatic union with Jesus. I find it surprising that despite three decades of research, we are not sure whether these phenomena are real or bogus, given all the hints that there is something interesting going on. Why not examine these claims in greater detail? Are they like alien abduction and spoon bending, or are they genuine anomalies like x-rays or bacterial transformation that may someday drive paradigm shifts and scientific revolutions? And why do you think I put that in there? Change. I mean, there's phenomenon that are going on that in medical science they're talking about. We're talking about changing belief systems. These people can actually physically manifest white hair, these different things, and we're talking about something internal. I mean, that, I, I think that you need to keep it in the proper perspective of what you can do. You don't even know what you can do. In psycho Dr. Maltz talks about a guy from South America. I tried to find the quote, and I couldn't find it, so I did it from memory. But he talks about a guy from South America that came in to get some work done on himself, and it cost him his whole life savings. The surgery was a success. However, the man's girlfriend came, left him because of all, he spent all his life savings. And she cursed him. And because of his cultural background, he believed the power of the curse. And a few days later, a bump appeared on this man's lip, and he, a friend told him that it was this curse, the South American bug that gets into you and kills you, and that he would die shortly. Literally overnight, this man took, lost a bunch of weight, and his hair turned gray, and he looked like he was dying. Fortunately, he had a follow-up appointment with Dr. Maltz, and he explained the situation, and Maltz told him that it was just a piece of scar tissue, not the curse, the bug. He removed it. He removed the tissue, and the man returned to normal shortly afterward. Get rid of the bug of your self-doubt, cut out the scar tissue of your past, and move on. Mm. Yeah, you know, I remember uh, Deepak Chopra uh, telling a story it's been years since I heard this one, so I'm you know, a little fuzzy on it, but you'll get the idea um, of a physician that he worked with that went in and had an x-ray done, and I think they found like a dark spot in his lung, and um, the doctor told him it I was this. cancer, yeah. and uh, the guy you know, died shortly thereafter. Right. And uh, then they went back and looked at a, an x-ray from like 10 years before that, and the same spot was in his lung and that it actually wasn't cancer. It was just, you know, something that was right. in there. And uh, that, but the belief that he was going to die, he just died. Yeah. Real stuff. Somewhere along the line, you made up who you think you are and you stopped challenging it. Most of the components of which you are not even aware of. And I talk about, you know, like when I was in my teens, I thought I was going to be this rock star. And uh, I made up all these identity things around who I thought I was at the time. And then later on in life, I cut my hair and got a job. But some of these things remained, and I didn't even know what they 
you know, I didn't even know they existed. And it's taken a lot of time for me to get through some of those things. And, um, you know, somewhere along the line, you made up who you think you are. And you don't even know most of this stuff. I challenge you to go in and take a look at it. Why not dig in and see what you really think about who you are and decide if it still fits what you want to create. I had all these BS things. Like as a musician, if, you know, like you would go... What I would do is I would go to places and I would try to look cool. I'd be like, I'd go to clubs and watch music. And I had this whole persona of I would stand there and I would look cool. I would not engage with anybody because it was about me and my ego of like, oh, I can play this or I can, I'm cooler than this. And then later on, when that whole thing kind of, that, that whole image kind of dissipated, there was these remnants of these bizarre identity things and bizarre beliefs that I still had that I had to go in and, and clean up. Like I want, always wanted to look cool, never wanted to look dumb under any circumstances, and it kept me, held me back in a lot of areas. Have you ever uh, not wanted to look dumb more than anything? Really? Have you ever not wanted to look dumb? The rest of you didn't raise your hand are all liars, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, have you ever wanted to not look dumb more than you wanted to have success? It's interesting, right, that we would not want to look stupid. Again, Why? I don't know who you are, but I know who you're not. You're not your past. You're not where you came from. You're not your family. You're not really even who you think you are now, but you identify yourself with it. Start architecting your new self. Mm. Yeah, Tony Robbins says uh, something that I love, which is the past does not equal the future. Right. You know, the past does not equal the future. Most people walk around reliving who they were all the time rather than constantly challenging who they were all the time. Yeah. The mind is a bullshit-creating machine, and it's going to do so every day for the rest of your life unless you get involved and fill it with what you want to create. So start creating some affirmations for yourself. Mm. I put a few of my own in here. Some of my personal favorite affirmations. Things just work out for me in life. My life just keeps getting better and better every day. I am strong, powerful, committed, and driven. I adapt and overcome at lightning, lightning speed. I am comfortable with hot women being attracted to me. I like that one because it presupposes that they are. Mm. And they are. I am the power. That's a great one. Build your own that speak to you. Mm. You know, I mean, some of these may work for you, but build, or, build your own that speak to you. How do you, uh, how do you use your affirmations? Um, I told you a couple weeks ago I was at the... Um, I was at the airport, and I, I, um, I was checking into Delta, and there was this woman that was kind of helping all the passengers kind of go through the, the self-check-in kiosks. And I walked up, and she smiled, and I was like, I was mesmerized by her. But I had to kind of check in. There was a lot going on. And I made a decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to her. So I checked in, and I was getting ready to talk to her, and there was like literally 10 people in line that were talking to her. I'm like, I can't. I, I got to talk to her, but I kind of got to go through security. And so... I'm going through the security and I'm going through this whole process of like, should I go back, should I not go back? And then I went and I dropped my stuff off. There was a team of us who were traveling out because I do other seminars as well. There was a team of us who were traveling to another seminar and I dropped my bags and this one girl says, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going back through security to get this girl's phone number. She's like, no, you're not. I'm like, yeah, I am. And she's like, you're retarded. I'm like, no, I'm the Mac. And there's other, other <laughs> chicks that were sitting there as well. I'm like, no, I'm the Mac. And I'm walking away and for a moment because she said, you're retarded, I'm thinking, maybe I am retarded. And as I'm walking there, like I can, like the self-doubt, the tapes start playing automatically. And instead of listening to tapes, I'm walking, I'm like, I am the power, I am the Mac, I am the power, I'm the Mac. And I walked right up to this woman, I walked out through security, and she was standing next to two other women that worked for the airlines. And I walked up to her and I said, excuse me, you know, I, uh, I had to walk back through security to find out if you were single. And I thought, that her face lit up, she's like, no, I'm not. And these two other women were kind of like, you got balls of steel. And I'm like, you know, it was worth the wait, or it was worth the walk. I never would have done that had I let those tapes play. There's no way I would let... They happen automatically. You have to drown out the noise. Now, you walked up to a woman right. who wasn't single right. in front of two other women. Correct. And you, you, know, worked, you had to work your way back through security. And mm -hmm. what you just said was it was worth it right. to do that. Correct. Why was it worth it to go through all that even though she wasn't single? Because of what I experienced going through the process. Mm. You know, facing that self-doubt those bullshit tapes that come up, it was worth it. So, you know, are you hearing he did courage? And it was also a compliment to her as well. Like, you know, you're hot enough that it was still worth the walk, you know. And I guarantee that made her whole day. 
Thank you. Thank you. The wisdom of Milton H. Erickson. Mm. Milton Erickson was considered by many, you've talked about him earlier, the world's foremost hypnotherapist that ever lived. Hundreds of books have been written about him and his work. Most of the foundation of NLP came from observing him and distilling his wisdom down to usable techniques. Motivational speakers like Anthony Robbins' programs are filled with Milton Erickson's work. And literally millions of people have been affected by this man's work, whether they know it or not. Mm. And why am I talking about him? Because the most powerful tool I've ever learned I got from Milton Erickson. I'm quoting here. Now, patients, they come to you, and they don't know exactly why they come. And since they don't know what their problems are, they can't tell you. And you listen with your background, and you don't know what they are saying. But you better know that you don't know. Too many psychologists try to plan what thinking they will do instead of wait and see what stimulus they receive and then letting their unconscious mind respond to that stimulus. I always trust my unconscious. Mm -hmm. The world's best says, I have no idea what the hell these people are talking about, but I trust my unconscious. And that spoke to me and how I applied this. When I read this quote, I realized how much I stressed out and worried about doing the right thing with women or saying the right thing and how much anxiety and stress this caused me. I used to screw up so many, so many situations by being nervous and being overly concerned with what would do and say that my friends used to call me Houdini because I was the master of escaping from getting laid. <laughs> you were the bastard that made that up. Punishment will continue. <clears throat> I also realized that I... He would tell me these stories. He'd be like, Yeah. I, you know, I, w I, was, I was out with this, you know, really hot girl and we went out and she was really into me and this and that and the other and, you know... And uh, we, you know, we went out to dinner, and everything was going really well. And uh, we went back to my hotel room, and we were hanging out, and this and that and the other. And you know, like telling me the story, like so I should go. Wow, that's really cool. And then I go, well, what happened? Oh, mm -hmm. well, you know, uh, oh, good. And so finally, I came up with Houdini because somehow he escaped without getting laid. Yeah. Yeah. And I also realized that I'd spent a lot of time studying the DYD materials and that I know what to do in most situations. Then I also realized that as a human animal, unconsciously I know what to do past all the social personas and BS. And you do as well as a human animal. So I started talking to my unconscious and telling it what I wanted it to produce for me and that it will see opportunity that my conscious mind may, not, may miss. And it will see subtle cues of women that I may miss. My, my conscious. And it will see potential negative things that I may miss and it knows what's best for me. And then I relax and let it do its thing, and I'm unattached to the outcome. Now, did you hear what he said earlier that was fascinating? Um, this notion of planning what you will think or planning out all of this stuff in the future. Have you ever, uh, you know, had a date with a woman where you, it was scheduled and you thought about what you were going to do and say on the date for days before it came up? You with me? So you kind of tried to script the whole thing out and script all the interactions. Anyone ever done that? Yeah? Well, what does that lead to? Yeah, it leads to a lot of anxiety, mm -hmm. right? This, now you've got all this thinking that has been invested. Okay, you've been uh, burning, uh, you know, as Dr. Paul has shared, you've been burning a lot of fuel in an inefficient way. And then when you finally do show up, you've already tried to think for yourself. So you're trying to do the thinking that you did before and you can't just act freely. Milton Erickson says, I trust my unconscious. I'll know what to do in the situation. And guess what? If I screw it up, I'm going to learn something. Exactly. I'm going to learn. Exactly. The mind virus of comparing yourself to others. Imagine you decided to join a gym and that you made the commitment to yourself that you're going to get in shape. When you went there, you saw many different people at varying degrees of being in shape. You may feel for a moment a little intimidated, maybe a little disappointed that you waited so long to get started. But then you'd quickly that would quickly fade and you would look around again and see what the different levels of development and muscle growth and size. You would then assess what you want to look like and if you're willing to do the work to get it. But you don't feel bad about yourself and compare yourself anymore. You then focus on what you're going to create for yourself. I used to go out and compare myself to other guys and think that guy's better looking than me or that guy is better shaped than me or that guy has more money than me or whatever. BS that came to mind. And I would use it to undermine my confidence. Now I focus on where I am going and where I came from on my strengths and my successes. And I keep getting better because I keep working on myself. Make a mental note right now to take some time to think about your strengths and where you have come from. 
And then the comparing yourself. I, I think that women sometimes, I was telling you, I think that women sometimes will do things, you know, to try to, try, you know, test you and see what, you know, if you are intimidated by other men. Recently, I was, at, uh, I was at Starbucks and I was talking to this girl. And this guy walks up, you know, where I'm getting my drink. And this guy walks up and he's much better looking at me, great shape. And he walks off, I grab his drink and walks off. And then she says, oh, you know, it's the great thing about working here is like, you know, there's always good looking guys. Now, so what I said to her was, I'm like, yeah, it's too bad you don't have any game. <laughs> and she goes, what do you mean? I have game. I'm like, no, you don't. She goes, yes, I do. She pulls out this wrinkled piece of paper that she's got in her pocket that's got some sort of like hieroglyphic like writing. It looks like somebody had ADD wrote it. I'm like, what's that? She goes, somebody's phone number. I'm like, did you give me yours? And she goes, no. I go, you're not going to call him. She goes, I don't give him my, uh, my phone number. I go, yeah, you do. And she goes, no, I don't. You're not going to call that guy. She goes, well, I might. I go, no, you're not. She goes, well, he is a little short. I go, I rest my case. I go, you know what? You don't have any game. She goes, yes, I do. I'm like, look, I, I don't have time to give you dating advice right now. I'll, I'll talk to you later. And I walked out. This girl, we had feeling secure. Now we have, you're hosed up, you know. And then I was with this other girl the other night. And uh, I kinda, don't have time to give you dating yeah, advice exactly. right now. I don't, have, I don't have time for it right now. And then you turned around and walked out. Exactly. Like, don't play games with me. Mm. So, like last night, for instance, if you would have walked up to the you know, girl at the hostess stand there where the other you know, few people were standing around, if you right. would have been thinking, oh, what if this guy has a problem with this? Or what if these girls think I look weird? Or what if she's busy working? Or she probably gets hit on all the time by guys or all this other stuff. Would you have gotten her phone number? No. No, you've been all focused right. on the wrong thing. He walked up and is just like, I'm going to get her number. So whatever's happening, that's where it's going. Everything else is irrelevant. The only thing that's important is, is it going to happen or not? He's focused on his outcome. Everything else doesn't matter. Then I was out with this other girl the other night that we kind of, I work with her, so I'm not really that connected to her. But we're kind of, anyways, context is not that important. We're ha hanging out, and uh, I'm outside, and she walks out, and she goes, oh, this dude in there was you know, checking me out, and he's hot. And I'm like, why don't you go get his number? Because it's obvious he doesn't have enough balls to approach you. <laughs> and she's like, I'm like, you want me to go work it for you? I'll get his number for you. And she goes, no. I'm like, go, go do it. I was in bed with her that night. That's all I got to say. All right. Anyways, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's like uh, my view on the concept of competition. This is also something I used to get really hung up on. I used to perceive that I was literally competing with other men for the attention of women and that I, di that I didn't like because I was focusing on their strengths and my weaknesses. All right? And I would doubt myself and say, what's the use? I live in San Diego, which just statistically is the worst city for men to live in for dating, probably because of the military presence throws off the men to women ratio, but it doesn't matter. But that's not been a problem for me. I have to budget my time to fit all the women in. Mm. This is truly a miracle for me. In the past, I used to budget my hand cream supply. <laughs> and what I, <laughs> what I realize now is that so many of you men... <laughs> Guys, there's no way this is getting the video, so just enjoy it. Anyways, uh, yeah. Yeah. What I realize now is that so few men really get it when it comes to women. There are literally thousands of women every man that gets it in every metropolitan area in the U.S. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> How do you follow that up? How do you follow up? I don't have time to give you dating advice, and I used to have to budget my hand cream supply. Well, I mean, it's the truth. The truth is if you understand this stuff and you internalize it and become it, there really is no real competition. And then I put down one exception. If you hang out in places that it's a sausage fest with a lot of good-looking guys, you may experience a little bit of competition. But most of the time, these guys get so drunk and stupid that they screw things up for themselves. So it's not as bad as you might think. But much worse than that is the Cinderella effect that happens from fives and sixes getting so much attention that they think they're tens. This is much worse than any true competition that might be had because you start to buy into it. Your best bet is to leave and save your dignity. Otherwise, you may regret it in the morning. <laughs> I like that quote from Jack Welsh. If you're not competitive, don't compete. Mm. This is interesting. You've talked a lot about status, and I've kind of been thinking a lot about how does one build status? How does one, you know, because it's interesting, it's an interesting concept, but how does one build it inside out? How does one create the, 
the things within themselves to convey that. And this is my personal philosophy, and I have had no formal training. So have a clear sense of your boundaries. There's nothing that communicates your status quicker than this, not from a whiny or victim spot, but from a place that communicates high self-esteem and high self-reverence. This is done by the way that you handle situations that compromise your boundaries. Your tone, your choice of words, your emotional state when communicating. My personal feelings can be summed up by a quote. You have to be able to walk away from anything in three seconds when the heat is around the corner. I love that quote from Heat. What this means to me is when the BS starts, no matter how hot the booty, you need to be willing to walk away. I have and I do. Your balance and boundaries are much more important than any tail. Because at the end of the day, after it's all said and done, you have to be with yourself. And if you compromise who you are, it's not easy to be in your own skin, so don't do it. I love your use of the terms booty and tail. Well, you know what I mean? So I, I couldn't read the bottom there at the screen, but so this girl's at my house last week, and uh, I made some mistakes with this girl early on. And we're hanging out at my place, and she's all acting all sketchy and whatnot. And I looked at my watch, and it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to sleep with you. And she says, what do you mean you're not going to sleep with me? I'm like, I'm not going to sleep with you. This isn't what you think it is. And she goes, what do you mean? I'm like, you're way too into me. And I could tell. And it's just, we had an opportunity. We had a little window. We could have done it. And that time's passed. She goes, no, no, you don't understand. Uh, what happens is I always, you know, I'm really into guys. And then they do something to screw up. And then I'm not that into them. I'm like, oh, you don't understand. That's not going to happen either. <laughs> you, uh, you know, I'm like, this isn't going to happen. And then she got really weirded out. And we left my house. And she's called me three times in the last 24 hours. Mm-hmm. But the point is, is don't, I, I, did it from the, I didn't do it to create more attraction. Ironically, it's like a boomerang. You know, I did it because I was clear that I'm not going to be hanging out with this girl. She's way too into me. She's got rabbit boiler you know, written all over her. I'm, not gonna, I'm just not going to go down that road. You know what I mean? My personal boundaries, my personal... The girl's way too into me. She, she, I think you guys understand what I'm saying. It's not worth it. Now, that's a, uh, an interesting, mature decision to actually make the decision, you know what, I'm not going to sleep with this person because they're too into me, and yeah. it's not where I'm at with them right now, and to just say it. This isn't what you think. Mm. Yeah. Develop emotional control. This is a telltale sign of those who have high status. Their ability to control themselves in spite of whatever is going on is a huge piece. I use techniques that I'll share with you later to help me get control before I lose it. I was trained to be a whiny little bitch because in the family that I came from, that's what you do. You lose control of your emotions and you whine and complain like act like a four-year-old in the hopes that whatever the offending instance will just disappear, that it will say, you know, God, calm down. All right, all right, you can have your way. But 90% of the time, that doesn't happen. You just get more and more upset and give an outside circumstance control over your inner state. And even though it almost never produced the result I was looking for, I did it almost every day of my life for the last 28 years. Now I use the never let them see you sweat approach that I learned from a mentor of mine who happens to be sitting in the back room. Ralph. Mm. I worked with this guy in the back room here. Ralph, I'll leave a little bit of anonymity. I worked with him for a few years in, in the seminar business, and no matter what was happening, in, like we would travel, and no matter what was happening, I mean, horrible stuff could be happening. This guy maintained a composure that I've never seen, and I've always wanted to, to you know, emulate it. And, and his whole motto was never let him see you sweat. And it's, it's one thing that, to have somebody say that to you. It's another thing to see a human being who gets it at such a deep level. And I never forgot, forgot that. He left the company that, I was, that I've been working with, and I never forgot that. And I developed some inner resources to start getting to that place, which I'll talk about a little later. But, I, you know, it, there's nothing that, that communicates I am the pimp quite like, no matter what's happening, I don't let you, you know. I am the pimp. Well, whatever. Like, <laughs> well, not I'm the pimp, but just metaphorically, like, I have control. Uh, I have high status. The metaphorical pimp. Yeah, the metaphorical pimp. We're using the term pimp very yeah, loosely here. I understand. I understand. You guys understand. Stop seeking other people's approval. This seems obvious enough, but yet we all do it. The degree to which you do it is the degree to which you, you put your internal validation and self-esteem in someone else's hands. This has been tough for me because David D. and I are best friends. One would think, wow, you get to call him up and get coaching from him all the time and you know, share your successes. Unfortunately, that's not really how it works. I used to come up and say, I got two phone numbers last night. And he would say, well, I'm really proud of you. <laughs> or I hooked up last night. And he would say, what's his name? <laughs> or some other thing to communicate what, what a retarded jackass he is. And why uh, does he I, say this? I, I really, you know, with my friends uh, from 
you know, the Count of Monte Cristo. I am bad dad. <laughs> why, do you, why do you guys think he says this? I take pleasure in torturing my friends. Because he's a dick. <laughs> All right? Because he's a dick. <laughs> oh, that was good. That was good. Anyways, that was beautiful. He does this for one reason, to teach me that I don't need his approval. At the end of the day, if you're not on your journey for you, for your reasons and what it does for your life, then it's all BS. Best friends or not, he doesn't encourage that unhealthy behavior in others. Look at your life and see where you are seeking approval from others and ask yourself, what is this getting me? Why am I doing it? And if I didn't tell anyone, what would happen? I'm not saying don't share your success with others, but know what drives it. Is it genuine excitement or is it need for validation? That's a big one. Mm. Wow. A self-appointment. You are for you as I am for me, your own best authority. Jerry Spence from How to Argue and Win Every Time. You make the rules for your life. No one else does. You can give them the power if you like, but on your deathbed, what will you say about what your life was about? If you're not living your life for yourself, the people in your life that are the closest to you have their own ideas about what you're supposed to be doing with your life, but you decide who you are and what you're about. When you give yourself permission to live your own life and self-appoint yourself to do whatever it is that you set out to do, you develop an internal sense of self and power that immediately communicates high status. The self-esteem that you gain from having your own game in life also ties into the building of your boundaries and emancipation from seeking other people's approval. Martial arts metaphor and the journey. I approach my journey around meeting women and other skills I plan to do long term like a martial artist. When you study martial arts, you truly get that it is a journey and not a destination. Even the masters have masters above them and they practice the basics over and over. They're committed to the path, not a destination. Because life is flu changing and fluid, they must be as well. And that they must practice and fail to get better. This is accepted and welcomed as part of the path. Why should meeting women be any different? I used to get really hung up on the outcome of every interaction with women. Every time I talked to a woman, I really wanted it to turn out a certain way. And if it didn't, I would beat myself up and not want to approach another woman for a long time. The martial arts metaphor helped me to recognize that failure is necessary and that, ironically enough, more knowledge and wisdom is gained in failure than in success in most cases. I regularly fail, and I welcome it. My ego is unaffected in the dojo. Anywhere I'm meeting women is my dojo. It will take time to attain true master of the skill, and anything worth doing is worth doing well. I quote Robert Kiyosaki, the reason you are not successful is you, have not, you haven't failed enough. You need to fail more and faster. Mm. The other thing I like about the martial arts metaphor is the unconscious process. You train over and over and over for a situation that when it happens, you will respond unconsciously. But when you're in a fight, it's all happening so fast that you don't even have time to think. You just respond. I approach meeting women the same way. I listen to the DYD interviews. I do affirmations and read books to keep my thinking on track. Then when I'm out in the world and I meet a woman, my unconscious knows what to do. I've taken the time to do the work in the dojo. I will keep be getting better as you will, grasshopper. And then I like to quote trading, uh, trading places. I'm a karate man. See, and a karate man bruises on the inside. They don't show the weakness. <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't know that because you're a big Barry White looking. It, yeah, mofo. exactly. This is interesting. I, I used to get, there's many people in this room that can attest to uh, what an angry person I used to be. And then I realized that anger isn't just one component. There's four different components of anger. I had this, I had this realization. There's the initial offending event, whatever it is that pisses you off. Then there's the wave of emotion that follows. You thinking about how jacked up whatever the situation is, and you get more and more angry a lot of times. For an unspecified amount of time, sometimes it's a minute or two, sometimes it's 30 minutes, whatever, who knows. Then there's the reinforcement in the belief that external events have control over your emotions. And worst of all, the self-esteem loss associated with you not being able to control yourself. That being said, what is really worth getting angry about? These days, if I get angry, I quick, quickly leverage it in a way to create change, usually in myself. And when I'm sure that it's done its job, I let it go. If it doesn't create change, I have no, no use for it. And what I also want to say about that is, is that what I've found is, and being a person that has, you know, the world class of getting angry, there's a pause. There's the, the moment the initial offending event happens, there's a, there's a little pause there where if you keep this, if you really, know, if you really accept this as, as the true experience of anger, you've got that moment where you can say, because you realize the payoff, you can say, is this worth getting angry about? 
And if you make the decision, no, you can stop it in the moment. And literally, I mean, hundreds of things have happened since I've realized this path or realized this, this new way of thinking about anger that I've not let myself get upset about because it's not worth all that. Is it really, ups- is it really worth it? You notice uh, when you hurt yourself, before the pain, there's that moment where you know it's coming. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? You slam your finger in the door, and then you, like, look at it, and, and there's, like, you know, three quarters of a second where you're, like, you just start screaming before it even starts hurting. Well, it's, I don't know, it just seems like it's about the same when you have yeah. that offending event, and then yeah. there's that moment where you can stop. You can go, whoa. Exactly. I don't need to go there. Exactly. The other thing that I've been, I've been thinking about in terms of gaining leverage over my emotions is the difference between acceptance and resistance. And uh, one of my favorite examples is traffic. Traffic was guaranteed at all times to get me pissed off. When I get into traffic, living in Southern California, there's, there's traffic everywhere. And I would immediately, as soon as it would happen, I would like, and I realized there's not a damn thing I can do about it. And it was the unacceptance, it was resisting. I was resisting, like something I had no power over that was causing this, this, this anger. And now what I do is I go into acceptance, like it is happening. It is happening, and there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. The only thing I can do is just get off and exit. When you go into acceptance, you also undermine the path of anger and all these, you know, in a way. And then, which is huge. There's a lot I could say about that. I could probably teach 20 minutes on the difference between acceptance and resistance. And you guys, Dr. Paul summed a lot of that stuff up as well. But, uh, and then decision versus indecision. Like, a lot of times I get frustrated and, because I haven't made a decision. For example, if I walk into Starbucks and there's a line of people, and I get frustrated because I'm in a hurry, for example, a lot of my frustration comes because I haven't made the decision if I'm going to stay or not. Being in that moment of like, am I going to go or am I going to stay, causes a certain kind of anxiety. But when I make the decision to stay, I go into acceptance, and then all that energy just goes away. I'm going to stay. I'm going to deal with it. Those two concepts are huge. If you can leverage those in different areas of your life, they're huge. Another one is victim slash injustice versus life student. At any given time, there's something that could happen that you go into victim or in, injustice. For example, flying out here on Thursday, I was running behind, and I was like, I had like three minutes to basically check in before I miss my baggage opportunity to, otherwise I have to take another flight. And I'm checking in, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got the whole thing wired. I'm, I got my car out front, I'm giving the, my bags to the, to the uh, uh, sky cap, and I'm like watching the, the traffic guys, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to make it. And he goes, you got to go inside. You're flagged. You're, you're marked for you know, this list. You're going to have to bring your ID inside. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you've got to go inside. I can't help you. I'm like, what am I going to do with my bags? And he's like, well, you can do whatever you want. And just then, my buddy, the uh, traffic guy, goes, whose car is this? I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm like, okay. I'm like, I tell him the situation. I get in the car, and I'm like, okay. So then, instantly, this whole thing is like, am I going to live what I believe? Am I, so I'm like, so I go into like, I'm not gonna, it's not worth getting angry about because this I'll take the next flight. And then I'm like thinking, well, there's the, I'm the victim here. I have, to, I have to go in and deal with this whole thing. And then I put it in the proper perspective because this is, not, this is like the third time this has happened to me where I've been flagged and I have to go in and deal with all this stuff. And I realized I could go off. I could go and victimize like 15 people at the airport right now and be pissed off all day. And you know what it really represents? Ten minutes a month of my time that I need to plan in advance for. Ten minutes. Is ten minutes a month worth going into victim and injustice. Basically, I just have to show up at the airport about 10 minutes early to go through this process. Is it worth that whole path? And it's like Dr. Paul says, observing ego. You have to, you know, start recognizing your patterns that put you into this spot and then make a decision. Is it worth, is, and I was like, 10 minutes. I went into acceptance. I was fine. I had a great day that day. I was running late for the airport. I missed my flight. You know, I had parking, and it was fine because I make the decision about what I'm going to get upset about and what I'm going to let you know, victim is a role. Injustice is, a, is, a, is the way you perceive things. Everything has a cause effect relationship. And if you don't step back to see what you did to create certain situations, you, you miss the lesson and also you lose emotional control. Mm-hmm. And this is, this are huge things. I mean, a few slides back, I said, you know, I, I've, I've been trained by the, 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 the best whiny people on the planet, my family. I mean, it's like, I don't have to practice that. Most men, myself included, do not like to fail do not like to admit we're wrong, and absolutely, under any circumstances, do not like to look dumb. When you go through any of this type of thing, the ego feels assaulted and takes steps to protect itself. The problem with this is that most of the useful learning and wisdom is lost because of the ego protecting itself by making excuses and putting the responsibility outside of itself. 
When I realized that, it occurred to me that because my ego is always there and it's always going to get involved, I need to tell it how to process the information. What I tell myself is I'm on a journey that most will never undertake. I'm going to learn things that most will never know, and that will require me to fail a lot and look dumb at times. But who I am is bigger than my need to protect my ego, and at the end of the day, I get stronger and farther down the path for doing things that most will never do. This you know what? Say that again. Say right. that, that piece, because there is a... There's like a nugget of wisdom in there. All right. What, what you, I tell myself yeah. is that I'm on a journey that most will never undertake, and I'm going to learn things that, that most will never know, and that will require me to fail a lot and look dumb at times. But who I am is bigger than my need to protect my ego, and at the end of the day, I get stronger and farther down the path for doing things that most will never do. Mm -hmm. And you're on that same path as well. Yeah, is it worth looking dumb once in a while? to get the reward that most people are never going to get. You've got to ask yourself that question. You know, is it, re is it worth the reward you're going to get to maybe look dumb walking up and starting conversations with a few women to get a reward that most people will never get? Is it worth doing the inner work that's hard, that takes a long time, that most people won't do, to get the rewards that most people will never get? Yeah. And this allows my ego to take the smites because I have reframed the experience to a greater frame and context, to a journey, a mission, a calling. At the end of the day, I can take pride in my failures instead of beating myself over it. Mm. Depression in the garden of the mind. My journey with depression. I went through a period of time where I was depressed quite a bit. I would get up in the, de in the morning and I would just, my whole day would be pretty much ruined by, with depression. And then one day I, I did something that was kind of interesting. I, my, I got up and I, my mind started doing its thing. So I, I just decided I was just going to let it do its thing for a while. So I laid in bed and I just let it do its thing. I just, and I just kind of paid attention. I had my journal there and I made some notes occasionally. I, I let it do its thing. And I realized that I, I sat there for about an hour, hour and a half. And I watched it intermittently as it was like thinking about things that I didn't want to have happen. Things that I... Didn't, you know, didn't like and focusing on where I wanted to be that I wasn't. And that pretty much ruined my whole day. Pretty much. It was like when you start the day with that kind of, and you let that kind of thinking run your day, you're hosed. You, you know. And um, I was right at the spot where I was getting ready to go get some medication for this stuff because it was so bad. And when I realized that, and I actually let it do its thing, and I realized what was going on, I realized I don't need medication. I need to control my thoughts. I need to keep things in a proper perspective. I need to set myself up for wins rather than failure. And I, Dan Sullivan talks about, you know, when you focus on where you want to go and, you're, and you're, that you're not, you know, the, the, long, the ideal and the long road ahead, it causes anxiety. And you're comparing yourself to something that is outside of you. And when you compare yourself to, how, you know, look at your past and see how far you've come, it sets the proper perspective. And you're able to give yourself some credit and kind of revel in your past, you know, successes. And so what I've been doing is a combination of focusing on what I've been able to accomplish and the affirmations, and I'm not depressed anymore. Not at all. Um, and I like the metaphor of the mind being like a garden. Like every day, you have to pull weeds. And maybe you go through a period of time where you're pulling weeds every day. And then maybe you go through a period of time where you're hoeing. <laughs> and then finally after you're hoeing for a while, it's time to plant your seed. Okay, anyways, I w write that down. Write it down. It's important that you do. Pull weeds, not pull your weed. All right. You are a very disturbed individual. I know. I learned it from watching you. All right. Don't Dr. Dr. Paul sitting in the back over there going, don't try to get him to talk to me because yeah, I can't I don't fix like this, this guy. stuff. Yeah. Don't be afraid to reinvent yourself. Actors and musicians do this regularly. Think of the careers of Sting, Madonna, U2, and countless others. I give you permission to reinvent yourself. Are you going to give yourself permission? Mm. The core, your core self will remain the same. It's not part of your ego or persona. It's safe. And I remember you telling me about Ken Wilber talking about how he's reinvented himself over the years. Ken, you know, one, Ken two, Ken three. And that fascinated me because it's like, you know, that guy's one of the most incredible thinkers of our time, potentially, considered by many. And he actually has... has Define that process for himself. And yeah, what he does is, as he evolves from one identity to the next, he disidentifies with the previous one and all the ones before that, and then kind of re-identifies with the new one, so he can be 
meta or abstracted from those and see those as something separate from where he is now allows him to continually evolve. Dr. Paul would probably say he's using observing ego uh, very, very well there. Develop a panic room in your mind. Have you, have you seen the movie, the movie Panic Room? You know what that's about? It's this, you know, a, some crazy movie about these, these uh, anyways. <laughs> don't, get, don't get nervous. Don't, get, don't panic on me. Well, the movie Panic Room, these people, these robbers break into these, this house, and this woman and her daughter go into this place called a panic room. It's a safe spot in the room where people can't get in. And I, and I thought about that, and I thought, you know, who I am is, is safe from any kind of external thing. Create a place in your mind where your inner self is housed. That's a place where your inner self is protected from any outside force. It's a safe and protected from anything in your external environment. This allows you to move through fear easier. When you know that your deepest self is safe, you believe that nothing can truly hurt you, it puts it in proper perspective. This is one of my favorite things here. Never dramatize human behavior. Your ability to understand and accept human nature will give you a tremendous advantage in many areas of your life. People do stupid things. They lie, they steal, they avoid pain, they flake out, they create drama, etc. That has nothing to do with you. I used to freak out if I met a woman and things were going well and then I made plans to get together with her and either she doesn't return my call or flakes out or whatever. I would internalize it and make it mean something about me. And the reality is it probably had nothing to do with me. It's just that women do and that's just something that women do and you'll never change human nature so get over it. It will happen from time to time, and chances are that it has nothing to do with you. Your ability to really understand that this is what humans do helps you not take things personally. It's a big one. I, I wanted to share some of my past beliefs with you guys, because you see me sitting up here, and I, you see a lot of people speak, and I, I, this is kind of interesting for me, because, like, you know, I've, I've been through a lot of different things in my life. I've had an interesting childhood, interesting past, as many of you have, and I wanted to share with you this is the kind of stuff that used to go on in my head that no longer does that I would be overweight for the rest of my life and there was no hope for me. That happened for years. And now I've lost over 125 pounds and I'm continuing down that path. That I was not interesting to women and that I would only, it would be only a matter of time before they would figure out what a geek I was and how afraid of them I was. That I couldn't dance and that if I danced with women that she would be embarrassed of me and I would look like a fool. That probably actually still is the case. Let me get rid of that one. <laughs> And that if I, if I ever had to speak in public, that I might have a heart attack. And this is one of my worst fears of all. And I'm actually up here in front of you. This is truly a miracle for me. Mm. I never thought I would ever be able to do any public speaking. Remember I told you about my karaoke experience the other day? Uh -huh. Should I share it? Uh, see, I'm not... Uh, these guys like karaoke. Dr. Paul, I'm, karaoke? I don't buy into the whole thing well, as, a, as a good concept, a good... I remember in my early 20s when I first observed the phenomenon known as karaoke. I remember... <laughs> One of the deepest fears I had ever experienced I remember coming over me because I remember being in the audience and somebody was drunk and they were, and they were singing and people were laughing and pointing at them. I'm like, oh, no. And for years, I, anytime I was even like within a couple yards of a karaoke bar, I have to like go in the other side of the street. And so I was out with these girls the other night and we're hanging out, we're drinking, we're having a good time. And then the karaoke dudes show up. I'm like, oh, no, damn it. No, no. Drunk chicks and karaoke, that's like, it's not what you want. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I gotta move through this. This isn't serving me anymore. I've gotta move through this. So <laughs> I tried to find the cheesiest song that I could find to sing, and I sung it. I sung, I don't know how many of you know, you'll never find as long as you live. All right, anyways, that was huge for me. I stood up there and I walked through that, and you know, I, maybe it's not karaoke for you, but you know, make a decision to move through some fears. Dancing was the same way. I'd be like, oh, no, I can't dance. And now you, I dance. Uh, sing a few more lines of the Lou Rawls there? Someone to hold you tender like I do. Okay, that's plenty. Thank you. All right, anyways. Oh, these guys are really getting into the... Uh... Dr. Paul, you and me, baby. Yeah, well, that'll be later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. If I did karaoke before, I was, you know, that probably would still be the case. Uh that I didn't deserve to be with an attractive woman. That was huge for me. And that at my core being, I was a loser and that everything good in my life was just lucky and that it could be taken away at any time. That was huge. Can you identify with any of these beliefs? Like hardwired affirmations you have in your mind? Like listen to that one. That I would be overweight for the rest of my life and that there was no hope for me. Mm. You let that thing go through your mind a few times <clears throat> until it becomes automatic. 
whoa, what do you do with it then? What do you do with it when it's just is coming up for you? You're no longer, it's no longer just kind of a thought. It's using your mind to think it. Yeah, it's huge. This stuff was, I mean, when you were on your path, I mean, you know, it's like I, you know, I don't know if I ever told you this, but this is a special moment between us guys. Can you give us a moment? Oh, a long you guys, t- for a long don't, time, don't I didn't start the path. Part of it was because I didn't really feel like some of the stuff you were doing was what I, you know, who I was. But a lot of it was I had such deep inner issues about this stuff that I was like, I can't do this stuff. This isn't going to work for me. I think you know that, but you never actually called me to the carpet on it. But mm. this is all, I mean, you can get through this stuff. It's all tapes that you play in your mind. Just tell your mind what you want it to create and then continue to tell it. And when you're ready for it, it'll show up. It just does. That's, it has no other choice. You know, the, uh, the one you were talking about there about I couldn't dance and that if I, if I danced with a woman, she would be embarrassed of me and I would look like a fool. Right. Anybody ever go through that one? Think that one? Yeah. Um, I remember one time I was uh, at a bar and I was talking to some girl and there was some guy out on the dance floor that he was doing the total MC Hammer on crack and, and couldn't hear the beat. You know what I'm saying? And... Uh, <laughs> I'm talking to the girl, and I'm like, look at that jackass. What the hell is he doing? And she's like, you know what? He's having fun. At least he's getting out there. Right. And I, like, I had a little epiphany there, you know? I had a realization. Same thing with karaoke. The fact that you got the balls to get up there and sing, it's like, it's good. Um, even if you sing out of tune, I, I, which, anyways, all right. Yeah, you might want to not look like a fool if you can help it. For some of you, there's, there's no hope with that, so just go ahead and do it anyways. All right. Let yourself be human and forgive yourself. When you admit your weaknesses and accept them, you know what? You Why don't you just insult the, the group here? Tell them how you really feel. It's very hurtful, guys. I want to apologize to you right now. Okay. One in three men is ugly. Look to your right. Look to your left. Look to your left. If it's not them... Okay. Exactly. All right. Dr. Paul was talking about this earlier. Let yourself be human and forgive yourself. When you admit your weaknesses and accept them, you start the healing inside. You stop resisting and open the door for change. The only thing that exists right now is the present moment. Basically, the past only exists in your memories. It's not existing in the world outside of your mind, yet you live like it's still real. Let it go. We all have places that we're insecure and we all have fears. All of us. Everyone. Most don't talk about it or acknowledge it, but it's there. Let yourself off the hook for being human. Just make the decision to never stop growing and challenging the boundaries of what you think you are and what is possible for you. Imagine what it must have been like, you know, living just a few thousand years ago when there was no history. There was no history of the race. The only history you knew was of your little tribe of people, and it was an oral history and there was a lot of, you know, mysterious kind of things going on in there. There was no history. All there was was what you were doing. In a lot of ways, we could become a lot healthier if we stopped trying to change our history or make up for it or live it. Will you hand me that book, Emotional Resilience? I wasn't going to read this, but I think, it, I think I'm going to read it. Um, Emotional Resilience by David Viscott, great book. Um, talks about a concept called toxic nostalgia. All right. How free you are to react in the present depends on how much you're holding on to the past. You can be independent or attached, free or bound, full of suffering or remorse. How you are is a choice. Your past bears witness to your experience, but the testimony is merely commentary that needs to be put into perspective. The most important perspective on your history results from the acceptance of what happened to you. It reflects your willingness to forgive others and yourself. Put simply, how you see your past is how you feel about yourself. Because toxic nostalgia intrusions overstate the negative legacy of your past, they tend to undermine your confidence. They tend to do so because the return of the old feelings as confirming your worst beliefs about yourself. Just because this morning your boss told you your memo you drafted was unacceptable doesn't mean that by doing so he corroborated your father's negative prediction for you when you were a rebellious adolescent. You didn't please your boss today. You didn't please your father when you were a kid. Today's events are similar only in that your work was, acceptable to, your work was unacceptable to another person. 
The past is not predictive, nor was the present confirmatory, except for your lingering self-doubts about your adequacy. These events are not linked. They are separate. The feeling process that connects them is toxic, toxic nostalgia. If you think your present performance confirms your old prejudice against yourself, this is merely your opinion, not necessarily a fact. However, if you take it as fact and you act on it as true, it becomes true. You have a history. You must come to terms with it. And that's all I have to say. Um, you know, I just want to say that I watched for, you know, because we've been best friends for a long time, I watched for years as you didn't get the kind of success you wanted in your life in a lot of areas. And what you did is you went inside and you did a bunch of inner work, and that led to uh, success with women now. It's led to success with your weight and... I'm watching as it's starting to be changing your career path. Right. And I'm confident it will lead to change there also. But it all started here, the common denominator yeah. for this. What are some of the uh you know, what are some of the changes that you made internally that you can see clearly led to these things? Or, you know, what's the what's the magic formula or the recipe that other people could learn from? Well, I started dealing with my anxiety. I started paying attention to it and what it was doing to my life and how it was ruling my brain every day. You know, the anger, the anxiety, stressing out about things. And, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, everything seemed to work out fine. I mean, you know, it's like I, I work in the seminar business and I put a, a, a seminar on a month someplace in the country. And technically, I mean, this is much bigger than this. And technically, a lot of things can happen. And I, you know, I, I, every seminar I ever did went off basically without a hitch. There were technical things. But I remember I would go into this emotional state every time I would go to set up and I would have this tremendous dread like something jacked up is going to happen that I'm not going to be able to fix. And it would cause me to have a horrible day. And um, I would do that in other areas of my life as well. And then when I started, I basically backed up and saw what I was doing with my thoughts and how I was creating all this anxiety. That it was not, I didn't need medication. It wasn't a genetic thing, which everyone in my family seems to think that it is. But it was purely done with thoughts. It was like pointing out my failures and what this could happen bad and this could happen bad. I started paying attention to what, the way I did that, not only in my work life, but in my personal life. And that was the first thing. And the second thing I did was starting to develop faith. I'm not really a, a spiritual person, but I started developing faith that things were just going to work out. You know what I mean? Whether or not you believe in a, in a higher power, whether or not you believe in your unconscious his ability to fix things, I started, things were just going to work out. And when you change those perspectives, um, you start dealing with your anxiety and start developing a belief that things are just going to work out. Trust your unconscious. And then start realizing that basically who you are today is because of who, who you thought you were in the past. And you really get that. And you realize you can start changing all these things in your life. It's like it's so freeing. It's so tremendously freeing that it's like a blank slate. It's like, you know, um, there's, there's this serenity prayer which is used in 12 steps. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change. Um, the courage to change the things I can. The wisdom to know the difference. Most people don't go in and they don't have the courage to go in and change the things they can. They don't have the... And you need to do that. You don't need to be in a 12-step program to do that. You know, you need to start thinking about what you want to create for yourself. And, you know, if it's possible for me, if it's possible for him, it's possible for any of you. And you have to have some sort of faith that it can happen. And be willing to take the steps, you know, to... A lot of journaling. You know, a lot of journaling. Get rid of the crap and fill, you know, and start writing what you want to create. I mean, it's not rocket science, guys. I mean, you, you know, what you've heard here today in the last couple of days, I mean, it's like... There's, there's a handful of simple things that if you take action on, it'll produce results that, I mean, are unbelievable. I mean, I, the fact that I got this 19-year-old, this 18-year-old, whatever, girl's phone number last night, and it's like I, I walked out of there, and as I was, I'm like, six months ago, nine months ago, that, that was never, and now it's just like, oh, it's just, it just happens. It'll happen again. You know what I mean? It's like, it's amazing how yourself, it, you, it just, you live into this stuff, and it's just next, next, next. It's like, mm. it's a miracle. But it's, it's not a miracle. It's science. It's the science of the mind. Dr. Paul was talking about this stuff. You don't know what you can change until you go in there and start digging. You, know, you don't know where the boundaries are until you start pushing on them. And most people don't because they think that who they are today is unchangeable and it's really who they are. No, it's who you made yourself up to be, who knows how long ago. And it's, it's, you know, until you go in and change that stuff, you're not going to... I mean, it's going to start questioning stuff. You're not going to really know what you're capable of doing. 
Did you hear he said uh, the first words? He started talking a lot about anxiety and anger. Yeah. It's interesting that we uh, spend a lot of time working on those things. Raise your hand if uh, you can identify with having an unusually large amount of either anxiety or anger or both. Okay, you can identify with that. Yeah. Um, some of the some of the material we went through yesterday, you know, that was kind of the tougher, dry stuff. And today we've been doing a lot of application and you know, learning some some more ways to use the stuff. It takes work, but you know what? It's worth it because these are real issues. You know, they're the real thing. You really have to deal with this. So, you know, sometimes hours a day, or even tens of hours a day for some people. Sometimes it consumes their whole life, and it's worth going in and figuring out the stuff. Yeah. Because not only does it lead to just feeling better inside, but it also usually then leads to success in the outer world. I used to think of myself as like a Tony Soprano walking around just busting balls all the time. I, many people in this room can attest to the disrespect that I've bestowed upon many individuals in their presence. But the energy, and I thought it was funny, and I thought it was cool, and I thought it was representation of my masculine energy. But, the, but what was, I was left with from you know, all this anger and anxiety welling up with me was I was eating, I was depressed, I was all this stuff. And then I, I started shifting my identity to more of like, instead of a Tony Soprano, more like a James Bond. There's nothing that happens that guy gets upset about. He is the master pimp. He just adapts and overcomes. You know what I mean? And maybe it's kind of cheesy to think in those terms, but it's something that you guys can all relate to. You know the difference between some, Tony Soprano busting somebody's head in and Pierce Brosnan sitting back going, that's right. I mean, it's like you can make those distinctions. You really can. You can create whatever you want. Mm -hmm. That's good. Give me a round of applause.